good to have you back again from a coffee break and we'll start half hour number three this afternoon and again for those of you joining us we just appreciate so much your financial help and uh, your prayers everything or mail my mail time is the best time of the day okay we're going to continue on with this series of the resurrections of the just as Jesus called it in John 5 and uh, we've covered the first fruits, and we're now in the main harvest, which is, I feel, the resurrection and the rapture of the body of Christ, because the body of Christ is the primary numbers so far as God is concerned. Okay, I'm supposed to, again, remind our TV audience and those of you out there, we have one book, only one, and uh, it's been so well received, and it has touched so many hearts that uh, we just got plenty of them on hand, and if you're interested, why, you just uh, call and write, and we'll get a copy out to you. Okay, let's just jump back in at the second portion of Scripture that deals with this main harvest, or the rapture and the resurrection of the body of Christ, which would be 1 Thessalonians 4. We touched on it the last part of the last program, but let's look at it again. 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll start at verse 13. <clears throat> because as the world situation is turning, I think everyone in this room, and I think most true believers, are anxiously awaiting this event because things are not going to get better. All I can tell you that much. It's nothing but a slippery slope, and we're on a downward slide. And uh, we better hope that the Lord comes sooner rather than later or we're going to get our feet burned. We may anyway, but uh, let's just hope and pray that the Lord will come sooner rather than later. So here is our blessed hope, as Titus chapter 2 calls it. Verse 13, but he said, I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. Now, see, he's just talking to believers. He's not talking to the world in general. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep or who have died. Now, there again, I think I made the point in the last taping. You know, there are certain false groups that refer to soul sleep. The soul never sleeps. The soul never loses consciousness. The minute physical death happens, the soul of the believer and the spirit goes immediately into the presence of the Lord, conscious. It doesn't go up there to sleep. It doesn't go up there to hibernate. It stays conscious and uh, waiting for this great event when they'll receive the body. Now, the lost, of course, will do immediately the same. They go to their doom, to the place of uh, torment, waiting for their resurrection, and hopefully we'll see that in the next half hour, if not this one. Yes, even the lost are going to be resurrected to be brought before the great white throne bodily, and from thence then to their eternal doom in the lake of fire. But right now we're dealing with the believers who are in the body of Christ, and all of our loved ones and our ancestors who before us became members of the body of Christ are all involved in this company that Paul referred to in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, that we will be in that lot or in that company. All right, then verse 14. We looked at it in the last half hour, but we'll repeat it. For if we believe, see now here is what I call the credentials for being in the body of Christ or to be involved in this great event. We have to have our faith in that finished work of the cross or his death, burial, and resurrection. That is the criteria. And come back with me. Can't help it. Keep your finger in 1 Thessalonians. Come back with me to Matthew 16 again because it is so hard for even good church people to see the difference between the gospel that the 12 were saved by and those other Jews of that day and for us today, as different as daylight as dark, but they refuse to see it. They just don't want to see it. And I'll keep hammering away at it. There is this stark difference. All right, in Matthew 16, we see the profession of faith of Peter. 
And of course, it was equal to those Jews of his day as well as those who were saved on the day of Pentecost and following, and I'll show you that on our way back to Thessalonians. But for now, so that you'll see what I'm talking about, Matthew 16, we always start at verse 13. Now, some of you have seen this a hundred times in the last 10 years, but once more, when Jesus came into the borders of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, the 12, who have now been with him almost three years, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who am I? Who do the people on the street think I am? All right. Well, they said, some think you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, anything but the right one. Now, verse 15, and he said unto them, to the twelve, whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered. Now, here was, here was the statement of faith that Jesus wanted from every believing Jew of that day. This was his statement of faith. Now, of course, he was keeping the law. They were doing the temple worship. But this was an extra requirement with the appearance of their Messiah. They were to believe who he was. It's that simple. And Peter puts it, verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. You're the Messiah, the anointed one, the Son of the living God, period. Not a hint about the cross. Not a hint about any shed blood. No idea of resurrection. But this is what the Lord was looking for because this was the gospel of the kingdom, to believe that Jesus was the Christ. Now, what's the word I'm always using? It's so simple. But, oh, they can't take something simple. They've got to have a comp. Somebody sent me a while back what he wanted to put in a tract. My goodness, it was two pages of Bible verses, and I just wrote back, what is my credentials? Keep it simple. Keep it simple. But, oh, they all have to complicate it. All right? So that was the kingdom gospel that saved the Jews of Christ's earthly ministry by believing, along with their law-keeping, of course. They didn't kick that out the back door. But they were to believe who this Jesus was. All right, now let's jump up to the book of Acts. And we got Peter. Now, even after the cross, chapter 3, this is even sometime after Pentecost, and they've healed the lame man, who I'm sure the Lord purposely ignored so that this could happen, because, you know, everything is by God's design. And so this lame man laid at the temple gate for 40 years. So he had to be there during Christ's earthly ministry, but the Lord didn't heal him. But Peter and John come along, and they do. All right? Verse, chapter 3, verse 6. Peter says to this lame man, Silver and gold I have none, but such as I have I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Does he say anything about the cross? Not a word. Does he say anything about the shed blood? Resurrection? Not a word. Well, what's he emphasizing? Who he is. Who he is. He's the Messiah. He's the one that's been promised ever since, especially King David. All right. Then you come on down after the people see the miracle and they're all shook up and wonder how in the world this thing happened. Then you come down for sake of time. Verse 16. This was Peter's explanation to the Jews in consternation. How did you perform such a miracle? And here it is. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, faith which is by him hath given him this perfect sound. Any word about the cross? Nothing. What did they believe? Who Jesus was. Now, is that so hard? Is that so complicated? that that was the kingdom message, that this is your promised Messiah, 
place your faith in him and God will give you eternal life. You'll become part of the kingdom. That was it. But oh, they got to confuse it and confound it and do everything else you can think of it and then try to say it's the same thing that Paul preached. Hardly. Paul enlarges on it. Come back to 1 Thessalonians 4 again. Of course, Paul enlarges on the fact that this Jesus of Nazareth was the one who went to the cross. Of course it was. And we believe that he was not only the Messiah of Israel, but he was the creator of the universe. Paul makes it so plain in, in Colossians chapter 1 that it was this person of the Godhead that created everything. And yet he's the one who condescended and took on human flesh so that he could purchase our salvation. Is that so hard to comprehend? All right, back to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14 again. So if we believe that Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, Israel's Messiah, died and rose again. See, that's beyond what Jesus expected of the 12. Now we're under the gospel of grace, that Christ has done everything that needed to be done. Now verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we as living believers, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede or go ahead of them who have died. And here's why. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump singular of God, not of angels, totally different from Revelation. This is a single trumpet blown by God himself and the dead in Christ. Now, you remember, I'm always qualifying. What segment of believers in human history are in Christ? The Gentile body. That was a term that is strictly Pauline. Now, granted, from Adam to the end, when they become believers, they're, they're gods, but they are not in that prepositional term. Now, maybe I better qualify now, these are things I don't intend to do ahead of time, believe me. Come back with me to Ephesians. Now, Ephesians, of course, is one of the prison epistles toward the end of the apostle's life. So we get teachings and doctrine from these prison epistles that he doesn't even cover in Romans and Corinthians and Galatians. But nevertheless, they're all part of the Pauline revelations. And here's where we get to it in Ephesians chapter 1. Come all the way to the last two verses. Well, let's look at verse 20. Starting at verse 20, honey. The power of verse 19 was wrought in Christ. Now, I'm in Ephesians 1, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, that is, at the Father's right hand, as the Old Testament pro prophesied, and as Hebrews puts it, that when he had finished the work of redemption, he ascended back to glory, and positionally he's at the right hand of the Father. Now verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. Now here it comes. He hath put all things under his feet, has given him to be the head, and I always follow that with not the king. He's not the king of the body. He is the head. And he is the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. All right, now then, as you come through these little chapters of the book of Ephesians, I think it's 93 times where you have the prepositional phrase, in him, in whom, in Christ. It's throughout these whole six chapters to show us where we are positionally 
the moment we become a believer. Now, in fact, while you're in Ephesians, go back to chapter 1, and we'll clarify a word that's twisted all out of shape by the theologians, and that's predestination. We're not predestined to hell. You're not predestined to heaven. You're predestined to a position in the body. Now, see, now that makes sense. And that's what the book says. It doesn't say a word about your eternal destiny. Ephesians 1, verse 5. Having predestinated us, now remember, Paul always is talking to the believer. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good player of his will. Now, in the New Testament Greek, what is the adoption? When the father hires a tutor to take his little five-year-old son, and he almost gives him over completely to teach him day by day up through his early years until he's about 15 or 16 years of age, and now when the tutor is through with that little fella, what is he ready for? To come in beside the father in the business. That's what it meant to have the adoption, to be placed alongside the father in his business. All right, that's what we are predestinated to. We are predestinated to a position in the body. Whether it's the toe or whether it's the head, we're all placed in a particular place. Now, I think in the last taping, I gave the illustration of the baby in the womb. For nine months, that mother is putting billions of cells into that little body. Does a cell that belongs in an eyeball go down to a toenail? Heavens, no. You wouldn't have a normal child. Everything goes to its rightful place. And at the end of nine months, what? The body is complete and it's delivered. Well, it's the same way with the body of Christ. Every one of us have been directed exactly to where God wants us. Now, it takes him a little longer to get some of us where he wants us than it does others. But we're going to get there. Sooner or later, you're going to get exactly where God wants you because that's what you're predestinated to. There's not a word in here about heaven or hell. Isn't it amazing? Now, you can come on down a little further, I think. Uh, verse 11. In whom? In Christ. The moment you become a believer, you're placed into the body and in whom we have also obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, here's what we're predestinated to, that we should be to the praise of his glory. Does that mean it's a fire escape? Does that mean you weren't predestined to hell, but you were lucky enough to be predestinated to heaven? No. Predestination is always into a position in the body of Christ. Oh, it's just irritating how they can twist the Scriptures, see? But anyway, all through this little book of Ephesians, we have this constant reference to being in Christ, in Him, and in the body, and so forth. All right, now then back to 1 Thessalonians, if you will. Chapter 4, and we'll go on. Verse 17. Oh, I didn't finish the last part of verse 16. I'm sorry. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ. See that? Those who are in the body and that have died physically, their soul and spirit went immediately into the presence of the Lord consciously. They don't go to sleep. They're conscious. Now then, at this great event, Christ will bring all the soul spirits of every body of Christ believer, which I feel began with the Apostle Paul's conversion. I know a lot of people won't agree, but that's all right. And all those believers since then are waiting for this great event. Because you see, they're not up there bodily. They're only up there in the invisible realm of soul and spirit. So what do you suppose every one of them are just waiting for? Well, the body. The body. Because you know what? To have a body in eternity like Christ's resurrection body, you and I cannot imagine what we're going to be able to do. We're not going to be limited by almost anything. 
and we're going to, personally, I think that we're going to have our abode in heaven, and we will be sent by commuter to go into the kingdom and carry out the Lord's work and commute back to our abode in heaven instantly. See, the Lord went back and forth, so we will too. Well, anyway, that's stretching the imagination, isn't it? But see, this is the glory of having that resurrected body. It's going to be limitless. And I always tell people, if you want to get just a taste of it, just go into the Gospels and read those 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. And you'll get just a little taste of what we're going to be able to do. In other words, did a wall stop him? Right through it. Did distance stop him? No. He could go from Jerusalem to Galilee in less than blink of an eye. Could he eat? Yeah, you people who love to eat, you're going to eat in eternity. <laughs> yeah, you are. I can prove it. The Lord did. He ate. He ate fish. And so, in Revelation, I thought I'd get there this afternoon, verse, or chapter 21, in the new heaven, the new earth. The tree of life is going to be producing fruit on both sides of the river. And what are we going to do? We're going to feast on it. So we're going to eat. Well, anyway, back to 1 Thessalonians. So he brings the soul and spirit of the departed believers so that they can have that resurrected body immediately and they will be a complete soul, spirit, and body again with all eternity. And then, then, after the dead have been resurrected, the great harvest, the dead of the body of Christ are resurrected, then verse 17, and then. We who are alive and remain, we're living on planet Earth. We will be caught up. Now, those are the two words that have been coined, raptured. And I just told somebody on the phone the other day, when they ridicule that that word isn't in Scripture, you tell them you just don't know anything because the Latin Vulgate says raptura, where you've got the two words caught up. The Latin word raptura, R-A-P-T-U-R-A. -A. Check me out. And what does it mean? To be suddenly translated, see? All right, so then we who are alive and remain shall be raptured. We're going to be with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever for all eternity be with the Lord in that resurrected body. Now then, verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. All right, now you drop down into chapter 5, and here's why I know we are in a pre-trib rapture, because of these words in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. But the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly or completely that the day of the Lord, the tribulation, is right out in front. Now, you got to remember, as I've been stressing on those little letters of those little letters lately on the daily program of James and Peter and John, they all thought that the, res the tribulation was right in front of them. They really thought that that was right out in front of them. And they had no idea that God was going to open up the timeline for 2,000 years. But here we are again. We're right up next to the appearance of the Antichrist. I'm sure it's going to be in all our lifetime. I don't care how old you are. We're that close. All right, so now then verse uh, 2 again. You selves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now verse 3. For when they... Now you see the difference in pronoun? What was the pronoun up in chapter 4? We. See? Us. Now it's they and them. Now, that's as clear as language can make it, isn't it? That's two totally different groups of people. The we and the us are out of here. The they and the them are the left behinds, see? All right? For when they, the left behinds, will say peace and safety. Now, we covered that a taping or two ago when we were back in Daniel. Isn't that exactly what the Antichrist is going to promise? peace and prosperity, and the world's going to fall for it. Israel especially is just going to turn euphoric that this guy has finally brought them the peace they're looking for. He's going to guarantee their safety. I think they'll dismantle their military almost overnight. And the whole world is just going to go into a euphoria over this man. 
And that's what all the world's getting ready for. This whole financial disaster is just building up a system that that man's going to present to the world. That's how close I think we are. All right, but now read on quickly. Only got two minutes left. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction. Well, I've got a time frame on it. It's of my own making. I say 11 months later. 11 months later, what's going to happen? The big Russian invasion. The invasion from the north on the mountains of Israel. Now, why 11 months? Well, you see in chapter 39 of Ezekiel, it tells us that Israel is going to be seven years burying and cleaning up the residue of that great battle. Well, I cannot see Jews in the kingdom burying dead corpses and burning up and collecting material. So it's going to have to be done during the seven years of the tribulation. Now then, Israel's way of chronological keeping of time was any part of a year is a whole year. All right, so if I give 11 months of peace and prosperity, and then let's say on from January to December 1st, in comes the Russian invasion. Well, see, then that's still part of the whole seven years that they've got to clean up. And so that's my conjecture, that there will be 11 months of relative peace and prosperity. Then the sudden destruction, of course, is the Russian invasion of Ezekiel 38. All right, then reading on. Sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they, the left behinds, the Christ rejectors, shall not escape. And so we have to look at all these things in the projection of Old Testament prophecy as well as what Paul says here. Now, I'm not going to go back to the Old Testament anymore. Let's just turn over to 2 Thessalonians in the seconds that we have left. And in chapter 2, Adam chapter 2, verse Eight, and then after we are gone, shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume at the end of the seven years with the spirit of his mouth, and will destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, this man Antichrist, who all the world is looking for today, is after the working of Satan with power and signs and lying what? wonders. What's he going to be? He's going to be a miracle worker. And the world will fall for him, hook, line, and sinker. And so we're getting closer and closer every day. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.